friends, one of the coldest nights of my life was spent overnight in a tent on the top of the Drakensberg Mountains in South Africa. The uh, Drakensberg is a range of mountains that uh, stretches approximately a thousand kilometers, that's about 620 miles, down the eastern side of South Africa. Its most majestic section forms the, the border between the small inland independent kingdom of Lesotho and my home province of KwaZulu-Natal. The peak that we had to climb to get to the top was around 2,400 meters above sea level. That's about 7,874 feet. Um, and in terms of Northern Ireland, that's not quite three times as high as Slieve Donard um, above uh, sea level. To get to the top, we had to climb a series of five uh, chain ladders, which amounted to a total of around 200 meters of vertical climbing, uh, about 656 feet. With a hiking backpack on one's back at, at the same time, I, I think it was one of the scariest things I've ever done. Uh, my hands and my feet were sweating, and looking down as I was climbing those chain ladders was just not a good idea. Um, I was uh, afraid that with all that sweat, uh, I would lose my grip. Now on top of the mountain, uh, it was covered with uh, patches of snow. Uh, and uh, once we reached the actual summit, the, the view was absolutely spectacular. That night, we pitched our tents in between some of the patches of snow. Uh, and as I said, I've never been so cold in all my life. Our gospel passage takes us up a mountaintop today. Uh, it is the closing passage of Matthew's gospel. Uh, according to Matthew's gospel, this is the first resurrection experience of the disciples themselves. And also it would seem, according to Matthew's gospel, perhaps the last moment the disciples see Jesus before his ascension. In this passage, uh, Jesus gives them his final instructions uh, in what is most often called the Great Commission. And the passage begins in verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And so this encounter with the risen Christ is what one might call a mountaintop experience. The symbolism of meeting the risen Christ on a mountain is significant, I believe. In the Bible, across and across many uh, different religions and cultures, mountains are often associated with spiritual experiences. In cartoons, uh, you will often find people climbing mountains to meet a spiritual guru at the top of the mountain. And one of my favorites is a far side cartoon, which shows a cow sitting in the lotus meditation posture, giving wisdom that only a cow could give. In the caption, it reads, in life, don't forget to eat the flowers. Another that gave me a good chuckle is a picture of a spiritual seeker on, uh, on top of the mountain asking the question, what is the meaning of life? And the guru with his long white beard replies with the following caption, you do the hokey pokey and turn around. That's what it's all about. Why are mountaintops associated with spiritual awakening and gaining new insights? I guess perhaps for two reasons. First, the mountaintops take you away from the hustle and bustle of ordinary life. They give one an opportunity to touch the silence and the stillness. And secondly, mountaintops give you a much bigger perspective on life. Mountaintops give one what might be called a God's eye view of the world. Ordinary life begins to seem so small and so insignificant when viewed from the top of the mountain. It can help us to see just how petty and insignificant some of our personal concerns and worries and our petty disagreements can be. This passage reminds us that mountaintop experiences can be important. Even if we are unable to climb an actual mountain, 
we all need to take time out of life to see life from a different perspective. One of Wendy's favorite authors is Martha Beck, and she invites her readers to get a new perspective on their lives, not by climbing a mountain, but by the simple act of writing out one's life story. Firstly, from the perspective of a victim, which is often a default perspective for many people. I feel like I'm a victim of life, hard done by, uh, unfairly treated, defeated. And then she says, secondly, she suggests writing one's life story from the perspective of a hero, one who has faced many obstacles, who has perhaps faced them bravely and with courage and fortitude, overcoming many odds to be, to be where one is today. The simple activity of writing one's life story, uh, either as a victim or as a hero, can provide a whole new perspective on one's life that can be enlightening. And so we find the disciples on top of a mountain, and when they see Jesus, we read that they worship him, but some of them doubted. Even on the mountaintop, it seems we can be beset with doubts. It is part of the spiritual journey, being gentle with ourselves in the midst of our doubts, in the midst of our questions. It was only a few weeks ago that we explored the question of doubt in a different sermon, in which we looked at the possibility that doubt is not always a bad thing. Sometimes doubts can be a necessary and even a helpful part of the journey. On our church Facebook page, I shared a quote by Rachel Evans, which reads, those who say having a childlike faith means asking, not, not asking questions haven't met too many children. If Jesus said we need to become like little children to enter the kingdom of God, that shouldn't mean we have to shy away from raising our questions and expressing our doubts. Then in verse 18, Jesus says these words, All authority in heaven and earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. I'd like to make just a few passing comments on some of these phrases. Firstly, the authority of Jesus was an inner authority that came from personal experience. He spoke with authority because he knew what he was talking about. He spoke from the place of a deep inner knowing. And that is ultimately the goal of the spiritual journey, that we too should come to a deep inner knowing of the truth about the, the nature of life, of God, and of our human existence. We too should grow to discover an inner authority that comes not from second-hand opinions, but from a direct experience of inner knowing. Secondly, we see that the way of Jesus transcends questions of nationality and geographic boundaries. He tells them in verse 19 to go and make disciples of all nations. And the Greek word for nation is ethne or ethne, from which we get the word ethnic. It's a reminder that churches or communities where Jesus is held to be at the center should never be identified with a single nationality or ethnic group. A church or Christian group that has come to be overly identified with a single nationality or country is in danger of, of not being fully Christian because the way of Jesus is meant to transcend nationalistic boundaries, make disciples of all nations, says Jesus. Thirdly, we read the words, baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. 
And as I often point out, the word baptism means to immerse. In other words, Jesus is wishing for all people of all nations to be immersed in the loving way of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, many Christians would read those words, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and immediately think of the doctrine of the Trinity, which would mean for most Protestant and Catholic Christians that there is one God in three persons, and that Jesus is the unique Son, the second person of the Trinity. But there are other ways of interpreting those words that are different from that shared doctrine of the Trinity held by both Catholics and Protestants alike. The word Father can be understood as a as metaphorical language referring to the loving source of all that is. The word Son doesn't necessarily have to refer to Jesus alone as the only unique Son of God. The word can also be interpreted as a reminder that there is a divine Son and a divine daughter that, the, that, that dwells in each and every one of us, and to which each of us must awaken. And the phrase Holy Spirit doesn't only have to be interpreted as being the so-called third person of the Trinity, but can also be interpreted as a way of speaking of the power and the presence of God's love and wisdom at work in the world and in our lives, as the breath and the wind of God's love, which animates all things and which opens us to living in the spirit of love. Fourthly, the mission of the disciples is to teach people of all nations to observe all that Christ has commanded. In essence, it is surely to teach others the way of Christ's love because that is the essence of what he taught, for as Paul says, love is the fulfilling of the law. And as any parent will know, the most powerful form of teaching is always by example. If we are to teach each other and other people to observe all that Christ commanded, it will be best carried out by demonstrating that way of Christ's love, not just with our words, but also in our actions. And then lastly, the Gospel of Matthew ends with that wonderful promise of Christ. Behold, I am with you always to the very end of the age. It's the promise that there are no God-forsaken places in the world or in the universe. The, the God whose presence is made known in Christ is always with us. For, the divine, for, for that divine presence that was in Christ also dwells within each of our hearts. We carry the very presence of God and the presence of Christ within us, wherever we find ourselves. Amen. Uh, may God bless you.